Hours of anxiety ended as a 707 airliner landed safely at Sydney Airport. We maintained 35,000 feet and diverted to Bris towards Brisbane. We were met by an RAAF Phantom jet fighter which escorted us from Amberley into, over the Brisbane area. We asked for a descent clearance into Brisbane and we were then told to maintain our present altitude of 35,000 feet. Why was that? Uh, this was because we were told later that the type of bomb on board was an altitude uh, control bomb and we did not know what altitude it was set to go off at. Qantas had paid half a million dollars ransom to guarantee the safety of the 116 passengers after a telephone caller had convinced officials that an altitude bomb had been placed aboard. Until later that you found out that there might have been a bomb? No, it wasn't until some time when we were approaching Sydney that we were told there may have been a... Uh, the, the word bomb was never used. Did you tell the passengers at any stage that there was a bomb on board? Uh, we told them we were looking for a, an object and we searched the aircraft thoroughly, including the passenger's baggage. I didn't mention the word bomb at all. Maybe about, about half an hour before reaching Sydney, they told us that they were looking for a box and that we were not allowed to land before this box was found. And, and did so you think that was a bomb? Well, of course, what do you want? Everybody was more or less thinking about some kind of a bomb. What was the feeling amongst the, uh, amongst the passengers on the plane? Um, the feeling was one of very, very much calmness. Um, everybody was extremely good, uh, although the nervousness, I think, showed, and the crew was extremely calm and, and uh, engendered calmness in everybody else. How do you feel uh, about the fact that Qantas paid half a million dollars for your safe return? Well, we're absolutely staggered by this. We didn't know until just a few minutes ago. Uh, and and it's, it's really a wonderful thing, we feel. Uh, we feel that this should never have happened, of course. The hoaxer, Mr Brown, collected the half a million dollars from the general manager of Qantas, Captain Ritchie, and drove off in this stolen hire van. Well, uh, as you know, there were a series of telephone calls uh, during the day which first indicated that uh, they wanted the money at the airport. But the second last call very suddenly gave us 15 minutes notice to have it available here in, uh, in Sydney. And Captain Ritchie uh, himself uh, took down the money uh, in two blue suitcases. We went down to the in the elevator together and then he went on his own, which was required by the, uh, the criminals. Uh, this was part of their requirement that it should be handed over by one man and that, that it should not be a policeman. Uh, Captain Ritchie himself went to the uh, entrance to Qantas House where the automatic doors are. He stood there for only a few moments. The van came along right on time. It was a yellow Hertz hired Volkswagen uh, combi type uh, van. Uh, the GM, Captain Ritchie, stepped through the automatic doors carrying one of the blue suitcases in, uh, in each hand, went over to the van. Um, the window came down, the man waved a little key, which was the device uh, that he had, in, had said he would, would adopt to identify himself. Not that I would have thought another yellow Hertz hired combi van would pass by at that time looking for a single man, uh, one man carrying half a million dollars. Uh, we couldn't get, or Captain Ritchie couldn't get the money through the window, which the man wanted, so the door had to be opened. He handed it over through the door. The door closed and off went the van with the half million dollars. But we got our aeroplane back. That's the important thing. Good. How was, Qantas, in it. how was Qantas able to get half a million dollars so quickly? Well, it's, it's a very effective banking service in this country. Uh, you just sign a cheque and you go to your bank and they give you half a million dollars. It was a very impressive service from our friends in the Reserve Bank. <laughs> The only bomb was the original one found in a locker at the airport. 
The task of finding the so-called Mr. Brown, of finding the person or persons responsible for the bomb ransom, has been given top priority by the whole of the New South Wales Police Force. And the police themselves are not without clues. The wording of the note found with the bomb, the wording of the telephone calls to Qantas, all suggested someone with a very close knowledge of airport procedure. Then there's the bomb itself. The police commissioner has called it a fiendish device, and police will now be seeking to trace the materials, including the altimeter, even the bag in which the bomb was kept. There's the van used to pick up the money. Police have built up an identikit picture of the man who collected the money. One picture shows him with a beard, another picture shows the man clean shaven. In the pickup, the man wore what was believed to be a falcon bed. Now, the money was collected in two suitcases similar to these. They're large, they're blue, they bear the trade name Duro. Well, these are some of the clues the police have at the moment. There are a number of aspects of it which concern us. And uh, the bomb, for example. It is a fiendish type of device. I suppose uh, persons with more technical knowledge than I would describe it different to that. But uh, it is being closely examined by all forensic technical experts that we can gather, including our own. We are concerned to know its structure. We're concerned to know the type of material which is in it, in the hope that we'll be able to have some positive identification. And I suppose one of the most outstanding features of it is the altimeter, or altimeter, whichever you call it, and it stands out there like a pike staff. Now, we want to examine that to see if we can to identify where it came from. We're examining the typing at this very time on the, uh, the letters which uh, were sent, both those addressed uh, to Captain Ritchie and uh, that to Sergeant Short. Uh, we're examining, of course, the type of paper that's been used, the envelopes in which it was in. The fingerprint experts are closely examining the paper to see whether or not there can possibly be any uh, uh, identifiable fingerprints on it. So far, this particular phase has not shown up anything. This witness saw the man get out of the van at the corner of George and Bathurst Street, reach back into the van for the two suitcases, and then walk from the van in an easterly direction along the footpath of Bathurst Street towards Hyde Park. I should mention to you that the man was also wearing dark-rimmed spectacles, and our witness felt that these were part of his normal makeup from the manner in which they were sitting on his face. A half a million dollars in unmarked banknotes. It conjures up dreams of expensive motor cars, a private plane perhaps, a palatial mansion, or even your own South Pacific Island. For Mr. Brown, they're dreams which theoretically could become a reality. But as the old saying goes, money isn't everything, and Mr. Brown's sudden increase in wealth isn't without its disadvantages. To start with, he's going to find it hard to find a safe place to keep the money. We'd be delighted to get a new account for half a million dollars, but uh, on the other hand, this wouldn't happen. And um, the average uh, large new account, as far as cash is concerned, if you brought in 4,000, it'd be as big as you'd expect, but let's say he brought in a fifth of it, 100,000, well, obviously he'd be ushered into the manager's office, and while the manager tried to question him without upsetting such a good new customer, uh, the teller would not only be counting the cash, but he'd be checking it against our list of stolen notes and our list of forgeries. We haven't had anyone come in with a large volume of notes yet to uh, put us to the test, but obviously this would be so unusual, it'd be well looked into, although we wouldn't want to be losing a good customer either. In Mr Brown's case, uh, we presume that uh, uh, he, he still has the notes and if he wanted to do anything by way of overseas investment, uh, he would need to convert them into some form of bank instrument, for example, a draft which would be uh, acceptable overseas. If he managed to, uh, to do this, he would also need authority to take or, or send it out of Australia. Second issue involving the smuggling of funds out of Australia is basically a matter of the before the Customs Department and the police, um, rather than the bank, and no doubt the Customs and uh, the police uh, will be particularly alert for this. Overseas financial authorities are aware of Mr Brown's activities and would certainly be looking out for any large amounts of Australian currency. Most people could be caught in a situation like this by spending more money than they apparently earn. If he pretended to have a salary job, then he should have a grip certificate. 
If he pretends to run a business, then he should have capital invested in it. And sooner or later, either the tax department will pick it up automatically, or one of his friends, inverted commas, uh, might drop a hint to the department. If he does take the bull by the horns and tells the taxation commissioner that he earned $500,000 well, through a robbery... Th this is a, a funny situation, really, because if, of course, the man would have certain expenses, he could legitimately claim the cost of the bomb uh, and of the hire of the truck, and presumably even the two suitcases, if they were right off at the end of the deal. But if he lodged a return showing 500000 the tax on that would be $337,211.00, and 16 cents. Um, and I think the tax commission would be in a very invidious position because the secrecy provisions would prohibit him from telling anybody, I should think even the Prime Minister. So it seems Mr Brown has got big problems. He can't take his money to a bank, he can't take it out of the country, and it seems that it won't be long before the taxation department catches up with him. And as if that wasn't enough, he's got police in six states hunting for him. Have you been, been able to uh, make any fines at all regarding the $20 notes supposedly circulating in Hong Kong? We did uh, concentrate on that in, in the course of our inquiries up there. But as you know, Hong Kong, uh, it's a large money-changing area, and uh, in conjunction with the commercial squad of Hong Kong, uh, commercial crime squad, uh, we... Uh, we, uh, those matters are still in train. Well, did you have any success at all regarding the $20 notes? Oh, no, I wouldn't say we had any success. Right, gentlemen and ladies, I'm sorry I keep forgetting there are ladies present. This is the vehicle, as advertised, that was used in the Qantas hold-up, as you know. It's a notorious bus, in so much as it got away with one of the most daring and audacious robberies that's ever been seen. It's not a robbery, hold up, or whatever you like to call it. The vehicle is a good clean vehicle except for one or two dents I noticed on the top of the roof. It has done exactly 35,291 miles. Now for the joy of owning a vehicle that you can say once contained a, a half a million, here's your opportunity. You can have a lot of laughs with this. Right, can I hear a bit from the bit? For the combi banner. Don't all shout at once. And I can assure you there are no police taking your names and addresses here. You can drive this down the street with the name Hertz on it with absolute immunity. They won't arrest you, I can assure you. Can I hear an opening bit more? Eight I've been bit for the vehicle. Eight hundred I've been fifty. Fifteen I've got. Fifteen. How he now at fifteen he drops his head at fifteen. At fifteen hundred. He done at fifteen hundred dollars once. At fifteen hundred dollars twice. Fifteen fifty right in front of me. Fifteen fifty. Fifteen fifty now he turns his back at fifteen fifty. He done at fifteen fifty once. Fifteen fifty twice. For the third and last opportunity to buy a vehicle that once had a half a million in it. You all finished and done at fifteen fifty. I'll wait for you. I should remember the name. How much did you expect to pay for it? How high would you have gone? We would have gone to two and a half thousand. Do you think it was worth that? No, definitely not. Not but as a car. Not as a car. I would say it's uh, probably as a wholesale proposition it's worth about 1400 What are you going to do with the car? Put it on our lot, prepare it correctly, first of all, then put it on the lot uh, and probably hold on to it for three weeks, month, and get all we can out of it and then sell it. This morning lasted little more than half an hour and not once did anyone mention the name Mr Brown. Number one court central was crammed to capacity as the police outlined their case in the cold, hard language of the courts. The defendants, Pointing and Macari, stood not in the dock but in the body of the court behind their counsel. Pointing, curly blonde hair, wearing a white polo neck sweater and dark trousers. Macari, small, dark, sharp featured, wearing a blue shirt, a light blue shirt and dark blue trousers. Inspector Vic Taylor replaced a police sergeant in the courtroom to prosecute this one case. He claimed it was Macari who placed the bomb and three letters in the locker at Mascot Airport. That it was Macari who made five phone calls to Qantas House on the afternoon of May the 26th. That it was Macari who actually picked up the money. Pointing, he said, helped Macari to make the bomb, typed the letters and helped Macari to carry out the operation. 
Inspector Taylor claimed that $27,000 had been found in Pointing's flat. And he claimed that Pointing had admitted in a record of interview that it was payment for his share in the operation. At this stage, the inspector said, about $460,000 was still outstanding. The magistrate refused bail in both cases. Gary Scully reporting for ABC National News. First of all, could you tell us how you found out about the money? Well, we learned uh, during the week of these premises at Annandale, which were being uh, remodelled, and for reasons I can't disclose at this stage, we felt it could well be a place where uh, money from the Qantas bomb hoax might be concealed. This was further uh, evidenced last night. We had arranged to put men into the house early this morning, but late last night, the contractor who was doing the work came to the CIB and gave information which caused the men this morning to go straight to a room where a fireplace had been recently bricked in and uh, then the brickwork had been plastered over. 